Tonight's topic is regarding inflammation, which all of us know and have experienced, but we'll be talking about inflammation when it's a silent manifestation and what the consequences of inflammation are for chronic disease. First, I'd like to make a number of thank yous. The administration of South Peninsula Hospital makes it possible for me to do the work that I do and bring this information to you. I am deeply grateful for that support, and being here would be impossible without it. The hospital itself, including all of the staff, also support the functional medicine clinic. And again, I'm deeply grateful for that. I think it's important to recognize the immediate team of VDOM and our manager, whose guidance and leadership and steadiness at the helm make us a better team over by the equipment. You'll see Carol Comfort, Christina Blanford. Carol Comfort is our patient services representative and also a functional medicine certified coach. Christina Blanford is our RN and also a functional medicine certified coach. Their level of insight, passion, and commitment makes me a better doctor, not to mention a better person. I'd like to thank all the patients who've uh, taken a part of their journey with us at the Functional Medicine Clinic. There's no greater privilege than to be part of that uh, information that goes with a person's health and healing journey. And it's one of the best things in, in my life. The community of Homer and your interest in this kind of thing also makes this possible. Lots of us know about inflammation because we've all experienced it. And this is my sophisticated drawing of a thumb after it's been hit by a hammer. And this was first formally described in 1550 BC by a medical provider, uh, Ebers, talk about the redness, swelling, heat, and pain that go with inflammation. So the thing to know about classic inflammation is that there are cells and signaling molecules in the body, and when this mechanical insult happens, then this whole cascade of responses starts. So little signaling transducers sense the mechanical injury, and they tell certain cells to go to the tiny little blood vessels and open up these floodgates so that fluids can flow into the damaged area, that causes the swelling. Then some temperature regulation changes in case there's microbial invaders that need to be disrupted by kicking the temperature up and the increased blood flow itself turns up the heat. The pain is a way of saying, hey, this area is injured, maybe you should use your other hand for a while, etc. So we all know about that and the cells of the body that are wandering around uh, along with signaling molecule cascades which are essentially like little radios that all the cells are using to talk to one another and send signals everywhere as part of this process. The immune system is also involved and as we keep trying to piece this story together tonight which is an ambitious story, what is silent inflammation? How is it tied to blood sugar and how is it tied to insulin? It's kind of like trying to tell the Lord of the Rings in 40 minutes, so be aware. We're trying to hit the high points here, make sure we cover Sauron and the Hobbits, but if we miss certain parts of the plot line, please forgive me. So the immune system and the inflammatory system are intimately intertwined, and I try to not use military metaphors as much as I used to, just because so much of functional medicine is about being in harmony with the body and being at peace, and so I found that those military metaphors that males in particular tend to love often are better substituted with for something else. But in this particular case, the immunoinflammatory functions of the body are best summarized by thinking of it like the military. There are spies, there are snipers, there's guns, there's bombs. <clears throat> so if we again use the hammer example and you uh, contuse your thumb, then it's like the Army Corps of Engineers going into the area, looking around, sensing what's broken, laying down collagen cables, putting things back together, and very importantly, then shutting the site down once the repair is done. The immune system's job is to sense whether or not there are foreign invaders or foreign items, orchestrate responses via signaling molecules and other types of communication, defend the host and repair 
the damage. So tonight you'll hear the term immunoinflammatory, which is a helpful way to frame some of the processes that we're going to be talking about. Normal inflammation is balanced, and what I mean by that is whether it's bacteria in the lungs or the injury to the thumb, there's something that happens, the immune inflammatory system responds, and then the body has an anti-inflammatory system for down-regulating and shutting the off switch because this is an aggressive event. So just for example, during bacterial pneumonia, if your immune system is working, a lot of the time you never get bacterial pneumonia because you inhale a little tiny organism that wants to grow in your lungs or even try to kill you. Your surveillance system senses that this thing doesn't belong. White cells come in and literally dogpile these organisms and start to swallow them whole. There's these oxidative bursts, which are these bombs going off, just blowing the crap out of all these organisms. There's fragments of them floating all over the place raging inflammation, just like a battle scene out of a movie. And then if it starts growing, then your body goes completely wild, gives you a fever and malaise, so you go to bed so that it can devote all of its resources to the war. And then ultimately, when the, war, when the battle is won, your body goes in and shuts all that stuff down and cleans it all up. So chronic inflammation is different. It means that there are systemic imbalances that lead to a loss of inflammatory control. And then there's an imbalanced pro-inflammatory state that's perpetuated through time and not being quenched. So here's a picture of psoriasis. This is a classic chronic inflammatory disease. What's similar about this to hitting your thumb with a hammer is you can see it. If it's somebody with asthma, you can hear it. You know when they're wheezing and they need their inhaler. They've got inflammatory bowel disease. They've got the diarrhea and abdominal pain. If they've got the arthritis, they've got the swelling of the joints because of the rheumatoid arthritis. So these are ongoing immunoinflammatory disruptions where the body is attacking the cell as the enemy. But it's not silent because we know that disease is related to chronic inflammation. The next step then is what about silent inflammation? And just to give you a sense of how long this has been on sort of the radar of popular consciousness, this is from 2004 in time. So this has been showing up in medical literature for a long, long time. And every single medical specialist and medical scientist has been seeing markers of inflammation cropping up in the work that they do for decades now. So what does that mean to think about silent inflammation. And the metaphor I'd like you to use, again, is a military metaphor. So think about parts of the world where the military is misbehaving. So they're rounding up civilians. They're disrupting civilian populations. They're, you know, doing... Uh, uh, imagine how corrosive and disruptive that is to a society or a nation. And again, all of the examples, putting people away that don't need to be, you know, blowing up somebody's garden shed rather than a, you know, a terrorist headquarters, et cetera. You can imagine there's no single big event, but it's incredibly disruptive and damaging. Well, it turns out that that's what's going on in the major things that are happening to, to contemporary society. So if you're over 50, the top three things that are going to get you are heart attack, stroke, or cancer. Right up there as well are dementia and depression. All of these have inflammatory markers when scientists look into this in terms of how this happens. So suddenly, this inflammation that's present for decades as low-grade disruption of the involved organ systems turns out to be a really big deal to not having these kinds of diseases manifest. And the silent idea, of course, is that you can't feel it. And I'll, sh I'll tell you the story in a moment about inflammation's involvement. From the very beginning of heading toward a heart attack, toward when it manifests 25 years later, but we could tell the same story about dementia, depression, different types of cancer, stroke. So just to give you an example, we'll go through this for a heart attack. So here you can see uh, this is the inside of one blood vessel in the heart. 
And then over here, you can see this is a diagram of the heart showing you that these blood vessels are big. They're kind of like a river in reverse, so the blood flows down the vessels and then it gets into smaller and smaller branches and ultimately the blood and oxygen get delivered to the tissues of the heart muscle. So decades before there's a heart attack, there's damage to this blood vessel wall and these are little molecular nicks that can't be seen, just little itty bitty micro insults that are the very, very beginning to where a cholesterol plaque is going to form. That's an inflammatory process driven by silent inflammation. Over years and decades, as LDL cholesterol and white blood cells and inflammation molecules start to sequester themselves inside the wall of this blood vessel and the, this opening itself and the cholesterol builds up over years and decades, there's inflammatory signaling for the blueprints of building that plaque. And then the day the person has a heart attack, never knowing it's coming, as that piece of plaque breaks off, goes downstream, plugs the little narrowed area, and then cuts off oxygen to the part of the heart that gets killed off, there's a shear plane in that plaque that has a silent inflammatory signaling component. So that's not the only thing that happens in heart attack, but it's part of it. And if we have people quench silent inflammation, we decrease their heart attack rate. These are two signaling molecules that show up again and again and again in conventional and functional medicine. So I've chosen them as the proxies and markers for our discussion tonight. Again, we're picking two hobbits and following them toward Mount Doom. But there's a whole bunch of these guys. So interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. For those of you that are interested in medical terminology or Latin, it's not as fancy as it sounds. Interleukin, leuke means white. Leukocytes are white cells. Inter means in between. So interleukin-6 is just a signaling molecule in between white cells. So high sensitivity C-reactive protein turns out to be a blood level that can be measured. And this is an inflammatory signaling molecule that comes from the liver. And the amount of C-reactive protein that's being released by the liver exactly correlates with the overall volume of inflammation in the body. So that person we talked about with pneumonia, their C-reactive protein is going to be kicked way up there, 15, 20, a big elevation. And anytime at the Rotary Health Fair or elsewhere a C-reactive protein is checked, if it's above 5, I ask myself, does this person have a cold? Do they have a sinus infection? Are they recovering from pneumonia, influenza, cellulitis, you name it. If it's under five, though, we're typically actually seeing a person's true baseline level of inflammation. And this is literally a perfect marker for how much silent inflammation is present. So I'm appreciative that Rotary International does this at the health fair every year. We know that there are direct correlations between C-reactive protein elevation and heart attack risk. And we know that a C-reactive protein of three has a higher risk than a C-reactive protein of two has a higher risk than a C-reactive protein under one. So one thing to know is that you're trying to get that high sensitivity C-reactive protein under one. If you have a chronic inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis, you may never get there because again, it's gonna push this up. So you'd always wanna talk to your doctor about what's a reasonable goal. So in terms of connecting the dots, where does blood sugar and insulin come in here? And the reason that we incorporated that into our silent inflammation talk is that we want to do some future presentations about inflammation and botanicals like curcumin, which comes from turmeric, or high dose omega-3 fatty acid fish oil to fight inflammation. But tonight we wanted to talk about blood sugar and insulin because these are the main drivers of silent inflammation. And leveraging blood sugar and insulin and optimal food are the most powerful insights and the most powerful tools for dealing with this issue. So to Get your head around optimal blood sugar. You now want to transport yourself back thousands and thousands of years. And I want you to reflect on the lives of ancestral people. When I put this together for Rotary, who was kind enough to let me do a dry run, I referred to ancient people. And then Carol said to me the next day, do you mean like 120-year-old people? What do you mean by ancient people? And so <laughs> we refined that to ancestral people. But if you imagine that you were out wandering the ancestral plains, hunting and gathering, what you would be eating is meat, 
nuts and seeds, <clears throat> vegetables and fruit, no grain, except maybe Kamloot, just in one part of Mesopotamia, and you'd literally be grinding the grain because you couldn't find any roots or anything else to starve on. So it'd be the very bottom of the hierarchy of things you're interested in eating. And then I mentioned to Rotary that, the, that ancestral people before the agricultural age uh, weren't milking anything, for example, jaguars. And somebody at Rotary pointed out, yeah, or only once. <laughs> Ancestral people had very flat blood sugar because they walked an average of eight to 10 miles a day and they ate that stuff we just talked about. So their blood sugar tended to be very, very level. So here are optimal blood sugar levels. If somebody's fasting, we'd like to see their blood sugar under 100 micrograms per deciliter and ideal is 70 to 90. Two hours after a meal, optimal is less than 140 and ideal is under 120. So what happens in terms of how are blood sugar levels tied to inflammation? Well, there's this process called glycation, and glyc just means sugar. So to glycate something means to sugar it. What does that really mean? It means that sugars floating around in the blood stick to protein. So this process is called glycation. There's always a little bit of it going on. And then advanced glycation end products are these changed, deranged, weird-looking proteins with these sugars stuck to them. So we'll just refer to them as ages, but it means advanced glycation end products. And we talked at the beginning of tonight's presentation about the immune system. It's always looking for anything that looks out of the ordinary. It's ultra-vigilant and ultra-aggressive. Well, guess what? These ages look wrong. So they stir up the immune system. Here's a little video on ages. Children are pretty amazing to watch. I could do things as a child that I can't do now that I'm older. I can still get around, but I can't get around like I used to. My mind feels young, but my body doesn't seem to agree. I'm a little worried about getting old. What causes aging? Scientists have recently discovered substances in the body that are key factors in the aging process. They are called advanced glycation end products, or AGEs. They develop in the body from the food and drink we consume every day. The body has a natural defense mechanism to protect itself from the damaging effects of AGEs. But over time, too many AGEs build up in the body. This is one of the reasons your muscles aren't as flexible and agile as they used to be. AGEs also build up in the skin, leading to wrinkles. Aging isn't just about wrinkles. Wrinkles won't kill you, but AGE accumulation in your body's organs can. Having low levels of AGEs will help promote a healthy heart, improve brain function, protect the skin from aging, maintain digestive health, enhance eye acuity, as well as protect and enhance kidney and liver health. Keeping your AGEs in check will help you live a more vibrant, youthful life. So here, another one of my fancy medical diagrams, to think about what's going on in terms of how these damaged molecules and inflammation are connected, silent inflammation, there's one cell in the body, and we're made up of billions and billions of cells, and many of them have this little sensor on the surface of the cell called a receptor for an advanced glycosylated end product. And using this fire metaphor, it's kind of interesting that this is a rage. Right? So <clears throat> here's this receptor for one of these damaged products. It sees this foreign item. It tells the regulatory part of the cell, the nucleus, hey, something's wrong. And what gets released into the bloodstream and wanders everywhere in the body? Tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6. We use this military metaphor again. This is like radio messages and signaling and couriers just going everywhere. Hey, blow up that garden shed. Hey, put handcuffs on that kid. Hey, drag away that teacher. Hey, raise that neighborhood. Napalm that garden. It's completely run amok. It doesn't make any sense at all. It's unnecessary damage. So there's these inflammation storms coming out from the cells if there's too many of these AGEs around. A couple of other brief things to know about advanced glycosylated end products is that uh, 
they can get stuck together and so they can plug tiny little blood vessels. And that's why people with pre-prediabetes, which we'll talk about in a minute, insulin resistance, if they have just these sugared molecules around, they can get kidney or eye troubles well before they ever develop any blood sugar abnormalities. And we don't have time for it tonight, but also free radicals are generated by these damaged molecules and those cause a lot of trouble in their own life. So where does insulin fit in? Insulin is released by the pancreas to drive sugar into the cells. And it's a, it's a mission critical hormone that must be in the blood for the cells to use sugar. So if there isn't insulin around being released by the pancreas, your cells cannot pull sugar out of the blood and use it as fuel. If the blood sugar is elevated, more insulin has to be released by the pancreas over time to keep up. And excess insulin causes trouble in its own right. So what is insulin resistance? Best way to describe it is in comparison to diabetes mellitus. So diabetes mellitus, which all of us know a lot about and have heard about and we have friends and relations that have this, is when the blood sugars themselves are above those levels that I showed you earlier over time, chronic blood sugar elevation. Prediabetes is if the sugars are creeping up. Well, based on what I've been mentioning to you this evening about the fact that we typically don't have blood sugars as low and as flat as ancestral people, we have extra insulin around years or decades before our blood sugar ever goes up. So if the sugar's just starting to creep up as prediabetes, then insulin resistance is pre-prediabetes. So Dr. Hyman's going to talk to you about insulin resistance. He's going to mention that doctors have some limitations in their training in terms of measuring insulin itself. And as a family practice trained MD, I can acknowledge that I had good training about looking for blood sugar coming up, but it wasn't until my functional medicine work that I learned the importance of measuring insulin levels themselves if people were interested in, in this early phenomenon. So that's part of what you're going to hear. Could you have prediabetes or diabetes with a normal blood sugar? Well, many of my patients have perfectly normal blood sugars, but sky high insulin levels and every other metabolic breakdown that goes with prediabetes. Yet when they come to see me, most have not been diagnosed with prediabetes. Even with limited conventional approaches of diagnosing prediabetes as a blood sugar over 100 and a two hour glucose tolerance test over 140, 90% of people who currently have the condition not even diagnosed. That's because doctors don't measure insulin. Think about it for a minute. The most common chronic disease in America, the country with the best healthcare in the world, is not diagnosing 90% of people who have this problem. We need to focus on treating and diagnosing the right problem, which is prediabetes. And by checking your insulin and your blood sugar, you can do that. So insulin is out there wandering around in the blood. If there's higher than, ever, higher than normal sugar levels, there's higher than normal insulin. And one of the most important things to know about insulin's effect on the body is that it tells the body to store fat. And the easiest way to think about this is, again, ancestral people. So imagine going for weeks or months eating just roots and vegetables and some you know, semi-rotten meat from time to time. <laughs> you don't have a lot of insulin around. And then it's autumn and you come upon a whole field of ripe berries or a tree just covered in ripe fruit and you just load up to get ready for all that cold weather and starvation. Blood sugar levels go up, big insulin surge, big time fat storage. Bears in Alaska, same thing. So many, 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 literally millions modern industrialized people, Americans, etc., are on a constant, constant insulin blood sugar roller coaster where we have a little blood sugar surge that we can't feel and a little insulin spike. A little blood sugar surge we can't feel and a little insulin spike. And every single one of those insulin roller coasters tells the body to store fat. 
fat releases pro-inflammatory chemicals called adipokines. So adipo means fat cell, kine means in between or movement. So these adipokines are out there and guess what? They're inflammatory signaling molecules. So this fire I've shown you in this picture, now these processes are compounding one another. They're creating this bigger and bigger fire that's fueling and feeding itself, all tied to insulin blood sugar disruption. This is a book by David Ludwig from Harvard. He runs an internationally renowned center at Harvard regarding overweight and obesity. And he's the gentleman that pioneered our contemporary understanding of insulin as a fat storage hormone and the hiding problem in weight issues. He is a big influence on Mark Hyman. Optimal insulin levels would have a fasting insulin under 4.5 milli international units per mil or an insulin under 30 if you have a two hour 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test. Now, one in two Americans has prediabetes or diabetes, what I call diabetes. It's the major cause of almost every chronic disease of aging, including heart attacks, strokes, cancer, dementia, depression, and it also causes sexual dysfunction, infertility, and even acne. Over 90% of people with this problem are not diagnosed, and your doctors are not trained to look for it. They're not taught what to do about it once they find it except to wait until you get diabetes and then give you a medication. But you may have problems going on for decades before it ever gets diagnosed. So how do you know if you have a problem with, with your blood sugar? How do you know if you're at risk for insulin resistance? If you answer yes to any of these questions, you might be just headed for trouble. How about I crave sweets and eat them, and even though I get a temporary boost of energy and mood, later I crash. Uh, maybe I have a family history of diabetes or hypoglycemia or alcoholism or overweight or obesity. Maybe I have extra belly fat. I feel shaky two or three hours after a meal. I eat a low-fat diet and I can't seem to lose any weight. If I miss a meal, I get cranky and irritable and I get weak and tired. Now if I eat a carbohydrate breakfast like a muffin, a bagel, cereal, or pancakes, I can't seem to control my eating for the rest of the day. I'm often moody, depressed, and anxious. My memory and concentration aren't so good. I have heart disease, high blood pressure, I have type 2 diabetes, or I have chronic fungal infections like jock itch, vaginal yeast infections, or dry scaly patches on my skin. Any of these things, if you answered yes to, could be a clue to diabetes. So just go to drhyman.com and take the full quiz and find out if you have diabetes and what you can do to fix it. So what's the best way to reduce insulin resistance, lower blood sugar, and quench inflammation? Any guesses? <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to wrap up talking with you about the mind-blowing powers of food to keep your insulin and blood sugar flat. So how does food decrease inflammation? Looking on that left side there, you can see that foods that have added sugar, refined grains, processed or packaged items, or sweetened beverages are going <clears> to <throat> translate directly to elevated blood sugar and all the problems we talked about. On the right, you can see that there's an anti-inflammatory aspect to food vegetables and fruit, nuts and seeds, grass-fed meat, wild grain, free-range poultry, eggs, wild-caught seafood. These things are anti-inflammatory via a variety of mechanisms. Big credit here to Carol and Christina who did the heavy lifting on these slides you're going to see now. Because of their functional medicine coaching, they have a lot of granular detail about exactly how to turn things to your advantage day to day. And this is Mark Hyman wanting you to be a serial killer in terms of how you start your day. So on the left, unfortunately, the cereal, the cereal bars, the granola, the oatmeal, the muffins, bagels, toast, orange juice, sweetened yogurt, store-bought fruits, smoothies, and flavored coffee drinks are all pro-inflammatory. 
chia pudding, eggs with greens, meat and veggie skillet, Greek yogurt, salmon, fresh green smoothie, tea or coffee without sweetener, anti-inflammatory. How about lunch? Now the trick to remember flour equals sugar. If you feel like, wait a minute, how does that work? Is because things made with with flour so rapidly are metabolized into sugar in the bloodstream that you can think of flour as fairly synonymous with sugar. So that PB and J, the store bought salad dressing that's sweetened with sugar, wraps or sandwich breads, canned soups, ramen, pasta all tend to be pro inflammatory due to what they due to your blood sugars, more anti inflammatory salmon salad with lettuce wraps, olive oil, vinegar salad dressing, veggie quinoa bowl, avocado chicken salad, grass fed beef burger, felt bun, homemade soup with chili. How about dinner? Inflammatory column, spaghetti with pasta sauce, frozen low fat meals, barbecue sauce, pasta dishes, pizza, and if it says low fat, they probably added sugar to make it palatable. Anti inflammatory turkey meatballs, you should make the spaghetti with a zucchini spiralizer, roasted chicken and veggies, salmon bowl with greens, stuffed with corn squash. Inflammatory snacks or pretzels, sweetened fruits, energy snack bars, chips, crackers, popcorn, sports drinks. And then the anti inflammatory column there. Veggie sticks with hummus, avocados, nuts, apple with nut butter, hard boiled eggs, kale chips. So our coaches have done a nice job of just trying to give you a whole bunch of examples to really arm you with ultra specific information that this is something that you want to incorporate into your own lifestyle. Chris Kresser is a luminary in functional medicine now. He's got a lot of interesting books, one of which I'll show you in a minute. And he points out that actually having a blood glucose meter, purchasing it with the test strips, testing your blood sugar, either fasting or two hours after a meal, interpreting your results based on these numbers will give you, is part of personalized medicine. And personalized medicine is part of functional medicine. So part of the evolution of medicine is for each person's medical plan to reflect who they are, what they need, and what their response is. And Chris Kresser's example is when that person eats a bowl of strawberries and they ask themselves, well, this is natural, so maybe it's fine or it's pretty sweet. Maybe it's pushing my sugar around. If you check your sugar, you'll know. So we've got diabetic numbers on the right, pre-diabetic numbers in the yellow column, optimal numbers at the third column from the right, and ideal at the left. And to pull this conversation back to something Dr. Bredesen on the preventing cognitive decline front said there's nothing more important than keeping your blood sugar where it wants for, for preventing dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So that column on the left reflects Dr. Bredesen's targets of 70 to 90 for fasting blood glucose and being under 120 two hours after a meal. Here's some books you might like, Blood Sugar Solution by Mark Hyman. Most of you have heard me recommend that before. Dr. Hyman's got a new wide-ranging book that just came out this year, which is court, full court coverage of all categories of food and what contemporary food science is telling us. Paleo Cure by Chris Kresser, tour de force through all of these principles, very thoughtful approach and a very thoughtful uh, defense of uh, paleo, <clears throat> and then the Grain Brain Whole Life Plan follow-up to Grain Brain by David Perlmutter. Resources we have at South Peninsula Hospital Functional Medicine Clinic include the fact that all of those labs we referenced tonight in the presentation are things that can be tested via blood levels and interpreted, and there are non-drug solutions that we offer to normalize those lab findings. I mentioned that we've got functional medicine certified health coaches, which is really a game changer for the lifestyle optimization that we encourage and that we see create so much good. And Carol and Christina are also spearheading our Facebook page. And all of us are going to be posting on Wednesday, so you can expect that to be pretty robust for ideas and inspiration. I want to briefly mention that I felt that it would be hypocritical to give this presentation to you without eating whole food. <laughs> so I deliberately jumped into the Whole30 a month ago and 
30 days in, I've lost nine pounds. But probably more importantly, most importantly to me in terms of report from lab rat number one in the maze, I had this problem in my upper body that started three years ago, typically male behavior. I'm always picking on males. I feel like I get to because I am one. I, I don't mean to be offensive, but I just see males do so many sort of humorous, backward things, me in particular. And so I taught myself to swim a mile, and then what really hurt my neck, back, shoulder, and pectoral muscle, I decided, oh, well, I'll just keep going. So <laughs> I did that for another month, and then I blew up that whole right upper quarter in my body, my neck, chest, back, upper arm, horrible pain, discomfort, tension. A number of gifted people in town, including uh, Rolfer and an acupuncturist and physical therapist, etc. Uh, <clears throat> on and on, you name it, a bunch of gifted folks, body work and massage. Got 90% of those problems to go away. But I had this cable from my from my shoulder to my elbow that was just torturing me. And one of the healers in question said, hey, Rob, have you tuned up your food plan? And I felt like, well, no, of course I haven't done that. So, <clears throat> so I had this intuition that if I went on this food plan, the last of my troubles would get resolved. And within a week of going on the Whole30, I had 90% resolution. I went to see Dr. Downey uh, when, after learning that my triglyceride number had gone from 81 to 203 in two years. So uh, based on that, I, it became clear to me that I was probably on my way to becoming diabetic like my mother and her father before her. Uh, it wasn't just the numbers. I had been having a lot of memory problems. Um, trouble sleeping, uh, muscle aches, joint pain, weight gain, digestive problems, and, and really mostly just exhaustion. Like I couldn't even get out of a chair in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, I kept trying to exercise more and get into shape by working out harder, and my body just wouldn't let me. Uh, my heart would race, and I would um, get short, short of breath. So getting ready, I finally made the appointment with Dr. Downey and getting ready for it. I was really worried that he was going to say no more sugar, no more milk. Um, we know those things. We know what we're supposed to do. And instead, his tone was really very positive. He never said, don't do this or don't eat this. Instead, after taking his time for a full history and learning about my concerns, he gave me a meal plan um, with a food list and a shopping list. Uh, and he said, eat this. Uh, try this, try this meditation program, try these supplements because they're going to help your body do what it is designed to do. Uh, he gave me all the information that I needed to understand that I was dealing with an inflammation that was really making my life miserable. It turns out that I was bathing my, day, my body all day in sugar and sugar substitutes and simple carbohydrates and it was just really more than my system could handle. Um, so it turned out that that diet was really acting like a weight that was pulling me down and uh, making every good choice harder to make. So the first month, it was all about the food. It was hard work. Uh, I had to learn all new things, cooking everything from scratch, but the results started almost immediately. After just a few days, I realized that my cravings were gone. I wasn't overeating. I wasn't looking for one snack after another. Uh, and I wasn't waking up starving in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning. I didn't have to measure anything and I didn't have to go hungry. In fact, it was kind of hard to eat all the food I was supposed to eat in a day. So through this process, I learned what was meant by a lifestyle change. The food plan Dr. Downey gave me helped me rethink uh, all of my meals in a way that I couldn't have imagined before the first appointment. I don't feel like I've given up anything because I have some of the, so many other things to eat now. After every delicious meal, I just feel nourished instead of feeling guilty and uh, full of regret. So I lost almost 40 pounds in five months. My energy is way up. My foggy brain is gone. Aches and pains are mostly gone. I sleep better. My digestive system is certainly settled down and I can exercise as much as I want. Uh, my tri triglycerides went from 203 to 46. Uh, and I know now exactly how to stay healthy uh, and what to do so I don't get diabetes. Thanks and good luck on your journey. 
So here's the citations. And we'll make sure and leave them up for a little bit so that if anybody wants to drill down further into this, they're certainly welcome with people who watch it on YouTube. And we'd be happy to share it with you as well if you ever want to learn more about this. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rob Downey.